Over the past several weeks, uh, we have been studying as a congregation from the book of Galatians on the things that make the church run well. And we are in our seventh lesson today of our series. And today we want to talk about the patience needed to make the church run well. Perhaps you've heard this American statement before. Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. But brethren, I understand something, and, and I want to equate this to the lessons that I've learned. It was when Stephanie was playing softball in high school. It was truly the end of those of you who have ever coached any kind of sporting event, maybe you can, can empathize with me and understand what I'm trying to say. As a typical fan, a fan last night would have said, you know those bad calls those referees made. Those calls where the guy came from out of bounds, back in bounds, without establishing himself. That was one thing that cost us the game last night. Or perhaps as the clock was winding down at the end of the game, and there was a clear violation of the shot clock when Wisconsin's man had the ball in his hand. The clock reached zero, and the officials allowed the basket to count. Well, when I was coaching softball, I learned. You know, if your team would execute the things that your coach has worked with you and taught you to do, you might win the ball game. And that's the exercise in patience. Because back when I was coaching, it wasn't easy being patient because you had worked with them, teaching them to exactly what to do in every situation. I must admit, I didn't always show my patience. But it's taught me a lesson through life. And I need to take the lesson of understanding that those three or four or how many ever bad calls you want to come up with did not cost my team the game last night. Because I can look at four or five plays that they should have made that they did not make. And that's the lesson in patience. Oh yes, I, I didn't chew on my fingernails, but my palms were getting wet and those nervous sensations came. But just so you know, I'm okay. I'll be fine. Because the sun came up this morning just like it did yesterday. Because all in all, it's just a game. But what about patience? When you think about patience and you think about the attitude of so many, we want it right now. But brother, understand something in the Christian life. Our whole life, the whole life we live as a Christian is to be entailed in patience or in long-suffering. And I think sometimes we, we fail to understand what that means. But Paul in Galatians chapter 5 and in chapter 6, I believe this morning as we go through our lesson, we will see three areas which can help the church when it comes to patience. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, you'll turn to Galatians beginning, let's go to chapter 5 first. And the first of our thoughts this morning comes from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 down through verse 16. Brethren, having patience can save the church from strife. And as I look at what our brother wrote, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another. For all the law was fulfilled in one word, even in this. And it goes back to the words that were recorded by Moses and recorded by Jesus himself that he spoke, where he says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Brethren, understand what Paul is trying to tell us. What is it that causes the most problems? And we can say this, whether it applies to our life, or whether it applies to the church. 
What is the number one cause of all problems? It is because Satan wants to stir up strife. Satan is the one who wants to keep the pot stirred. He always wants us at odds one with another. And Brethren Paul gives us a very plain warning. He says, if you bite and you devour one another, you will, not you might, not you could be, but he says, you will be consumed. When I am overly consumed with what is going on and how someone may have wronged me, Satan is winning the battle. Satan is showing me that I'm not going to be very patient. I'm going to develop what I like to term and what some of you know as a short fuse. And we fly off at the cuff. We do things where we engage our mouth before we engage our brain. And brethren, remember, once we say those things, once we continue to keep strife stirred up, we can never bring back our words that we speak. But you know, as I think about saving the church from strife, when we are patient, it will help us and it will enable us to keep the unity of the Spirit. If you go back to the book of Ephesians and you look in chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 3, Paul there, he says, I beseech you, as a prisoner of the Lord, to walk worthy of the calling in which you are called. But I want you to notice the last part of the verse. Go to verse 3, where he says, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Brother, understand something about strife in the church. He's not just talking about unity in general. He's not talking about just going along to get along. What Paul is trying to tell us as he speaks about unity, he's saying you must be unified in the Spirit. And when he speaks of being unified in the Spirit, he is speaking about how we must be unified through and in God's Word. Because when we go outside the realm of what the Spirit has given us, there is no true unity. As a matter of fact, I suggest to you, when we go outside of the unity of the Spirit, when we go outside the unity of God's Word, we're going to bring strife among ourselves. And you see, that's why I say that the majority of problems, whether it be in our personal life or it be in the church, it is because we delve over into the realm of opinion rather, stay, rather than staying in the realm of doctrine and in the realm of truth. And you see, this unity of the Spirit, what will it do for us? It will cause us to accept each other's peculiarities. Because there are no two of us in this assembly this morning that are the same. We all have our unique features. And I think I'll leave it at that. We're all different. We're, we're all different. And we need to blend our differences so that we might be one. You see, it can also cause us to overlook Another's, and notice here's the key, non-sinful faults. If I were to have a question and answer session after our services where anyone can ask questions, and I allowed Kay to come up, and you could ask her about differences, she's going to have things that she's going to say that she doesn't like that I do, and I'm going to tell you things about her that she does that I don't like. That's just human nature, isn't it? That's right. But the key is, we can overlook each other's non-sinful faults. 
It's when our faults become sinful that we need to be concerned one for another. And someone says, now Brother Ray, how in the world can you determine sinful and non-sinful faults? Well, again, that's easy. Because when I stay in the realm of truth, in the unity of the Spirit, the Word, I can see what sin is and what sin is not. It is not a sin for her to cook perfect biscuits. Which, by the way, she does very frequently. She has become the biscuit master. But it is not sinful for her to occasionally get them a little overcooked. Those are the kind that make the best for biscuits and gravy, by the way. That's free information. It's, it's, it's not, I have to overlook sometimes those faults. And the reason I need to overlook those faults is because I need to be appreciative of the effort she put forth to put something on the table before me. Amen. It doesn't always have to taste the best. It just needs to fill a need. And please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying she's a bad cook. Because she's a good cook. For example, a couple of weeks ago, she made spaghetti almost from scratch. And you might say, well, what's the big deal about that? That's the way she used to do it when she was trying to impress me to ask her to marry her when we were dating in college. And it was just as good the other night as it was some, well, that, that's none of your business how many years ago that was. But you see, you just learn to be patient with one another. And if we can learn that in the home and in the family, why can't we translate that over to the spiritual family, which is more valuable than the home? And somebody says, that's how you figure it. Remember, the church is the bride of Christ which gives it more value. But not only will it help me do those two things, it will also cause me to forgive. It will cause me to forgive one who is penitent, one who has lived in sin and has the desire to come home. And it doesn't matter how many times they stray away. My responsibility when they come home is to forgive and to encourage them to be faithful. When we do that, strife will cease. You see, patience will limit our strife. But secondly, this morning as I continue reading in the book of Galatians, I go to chapter 6, and I begin in verse 1, and I look down through verse 5. Notice there he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in on one another. For each shall bear his own burden. Let him who is taught the Word, share in all good things with Him who teaches. As I look at those verses, we've heard and I have preached sermons from that passage on the three bears, the three things that we ought to bear for one another. And you know, as I was looking and studying and preparing for this lesson, I looked at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Do you see the irony in that verse? Do, do you see a, a thought that might you might miss from that verse? When we think about patience being able to save lost brethren, I remember as we assembled around the Lord's table this morning that there was one who was willing to die for me. Do you realize Christ bore your burden and fulfilled the will of God? 
Brethren, if Christ, through His life, through His teaching, through His death, His burial, and His resurrection, gives me the opportunity to have my sins taken away and to have my hope for eternity in heaven, if He can do that for me while I was His enemy, should we not show the same patience for those who are lost in sin today? Remember, we want it now. But that's not the way God works. God sometimes will answer our prayers, yes, you can have that right now. He answers our prayers, no, you don't need that right now. Or He may answer, and this is the case in many times, many ways. He says, no, you're not ready for that. What's He saying? He's saying, no, be patient. So as we think about working with those who are lost, those who are outside the ark of safety of the church, those who have been in the church and left the church, we need to be patient. How do we do that, Brother Ray? How can, how can I learn to be patient? Well, it's done by patient teaching and preaching. Do you realize that some, the, the, the majority that fall away are those who are weak in the faith? Yep. And you know they're weak in the faith because they haven't been taught. They haven't been shown the full part of the Word. And so that's why Paul, when you come to 2 Timothy chapter 2, notice what he says there in verse 24 down through verse 26. He says there, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Do you see what Paul is telling us? Paul is telling us as a servant of the Lord, as a Christian, what's my responsibility? My responsibility is to gain the ability to teach others. My responsibility is to be patient as I teach others. I know, you know, we live in a world where we expect instantaneous results. Is that right? Yeah. Go to this afternoon when you leave the, the building this morning as we break from our assembly. You drive down Highland and go in towards town. You're going to pass Popeye's. You're going to pass Wendy's. You're going to pass Taco Bell. You're going to pass Long John Silver's before you get to the stoplight to turn into Beavis. I think that's the only four fast food restaurants there are on this side of town. I, I, you know, I visit them frequently, so I think that's right. But when you drive in, and you go and you place your order at the window, and they say, will that be all? How long do you expect it to be before you get your food? Do you not expect your food to be ready within two minutes? You see, the goal of most drive-thrus is to have you in and out from the speaker box, driving away with your food, no longer than two and a half minutes. And in many cases, they want you, I miss McDonald's, I'm sorry. They want you in and out as fast as they can. Why? Because they want to serve the next person who's impatient to get their food. But you and I can be patient with folks because patience is a trained behavior. The ability to teach is something that takes training. But turn over just one, one page in your Bible possibly to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse 1 through verse 5. And in this passage Paul says to the young preacher, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead as appearing and in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. When it's popular and when it's not popular. 
convince, rebuke, exhort. And here's the part we miss. With all long suffering and teaching. Brethren, sometimes we lose patience with those who are lost. Because we expect them to be at the level of knowledge we're at a whole lot faster. And so I encourage you to do this. I want you to think about your own life when you're speaking with someone and trying to teach them. How long did it take you to get to the place that you're at in your knowledge of the Word? And when you remember that fact, you will understand patience. But Paul goes on and says, the time is going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill becomes personal right here. Your ministry. Whose job is it to teach the lost? Oh, there are many in the world today, even many in the church, that say, well, that's the preacher's job. Don't you know that's why we pay the preacher is to do our work for us? Now, I'm, I'm not the brightest light bulb there is. And I'm not saying I don't want to work. But someone find in Scripture where it says you can have your teaching done by prophecy. And by that I mean, where does it say that you can have someone else do and take your responsibility upon them? And you delegate it. Let me ask you a question. On the first day of the week, we come together and we assemble together to worship, correct? Can someone pray for you? Well, Brother Ray, we have, we have someone that comes up and he stands before us and he prays before us. He's not praying for you. You're to be praying with him. Oh, well, okay. Well, what about singing? Can someone sing for you? Some of you may wish someone could sing for you. But nobody can sing for you. How about give for you? Can, can someone else give for you? You're looking at me like, Brother Ray, you're, you're, are you losing your mind? Of course they can't do that for you. They can't do the Lord's Supper for you. They can't partake of the Lord's Supper for you. There's nothing in the Christian life that someone can do for you. Because the Christian life is lived as an individual as well as collectively. And so when it comes to patient teaching and preaching, that responsibility falls on all of us to reach those Poor loss. Or then here's one that we forget oftentimes. And that is that we can save lost brethren with patient warning and discipline. And I know a lot of people don't like to hear about warnings. They don't want to talk about church discipline. But brethren, it's something that worked in the first century. And if it worked in the first century... It will work today. Notice these two passages in the book of Thessalonians. First one's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Notice what Paul says to our brethren in Thessalonica. He says there, Now we exhort you, brethren. Exhort. What does that mean? Encourage. And not just encourage. It's a very strong encouragement. He says, Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. Uphold the weak. And I like what he puts at the end of the verse. Be patient with all. See, brother, we like to warn the unruly. But we like to leave the patient part out. Or look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 in verse 6. Now this time he's going to go a little bit further in his words to our brother Thessalonica. He says, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ... That you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition 
which he received from us. Command? A command to do that, yes. Brethren, that's a subject we need to study. And we need to look at it. And as I say that, understand something. I'm not saying that we make rash judgments and rash thoughts towards someone who is walking unruly and needs to be withdrawn from. One, in my opinion, who needs to be withdrawn from is one who shows a habitual continuation in an activity. But notice, I'll say this. We need to do it without the attitude of vengeance. Because that's the way most people per perceive discipline. You're doing it just to be mean. You're doing it just to be ugly. No, you're doing it to save their soul. And when you do it with great patience, and by the way, with patience comes prayer. When you do it in that manner, you can save the lost brethren. But point number three this morning, it can save a Christian from disaster. Look with me in verse 7 and verse down through verse 9 of Galatians chapter 6. I better turn back there instead of reading 2 Timothy 4. Verse 7 down through verse 9. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit receive everlasting life. And let us not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Brethren, for us to keep our own lives from disaster, if we will remember very simply the law of harvest that God has set forth, you notice what he said in verse 7 and verse 8. Whatever we sow, that is what we're going to reap. If we sow to the Spirit, what are we going to reap? Nothing will be able to prevent us from reaping eternal life. But if we sow to the flesh, our receipt, our, our, what we're going to receive is going to be our eternal corruption, our eternal punishment. But I encourage you, don't only remember about the harvest. Notice that the harvest, and here's the lesson, is not immediate. It's not immediate. You notice what he says in verse 9. Do not grow weary in well-doing. For in, notice there's the word, do season. When the time is right, you will reap. You will reap when the time is right. You see, you and I, we've got to be willing to wait for the full reward. I'm reminded back in Mark chapter 10 of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he looks at Jesus and he says to him, Tell me what I need to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responds and replies to the rich young ruler, Obey the commandments. And he lists them off for him. And I want you to notice their young man's reply in verse 20. He showed his impatient attitude. He says, I have done these things since I was a youth. The young man says, I've obeyed what you asked me to do. Now give me my reward. Understand, brother, that's not how God's law of harvest works. And so what happens to us in our feeble mind, we decide, okay, God's plan must not be working since I'm not seeing the immediate results. So I'll just circumvent His way and I'll do it my way. 
And brethren, when we do it our way, it brings disaster to our life. And remember, no matter what condition you may be facing right now, remember, what you're facing right now is not God's last word. I look back over in the corner and I see a winner back there. I see the, the, the victor who has overcome cancer numerous times, Sister Diana. And I will guarantee you that she will tell you the reason she's victorious, first she'll give the glory and the credit to God. But secondly, she'll say thank you to all of you for praying for her. You see, God's final word hasn't been spoken in your life. His final <laughs> word hasn't been spoken in my life. But I know this morning as we come to a close, He's not going to be mocked. I know that God is not going to be mocked because I'm going to reap what I sow. And so, what I need to understand is, be patient. Living life on this earth is hard. But the retirement benefits when we pass from this life to the next life are far beyond what we can expect. So this morning, we may have one who is not a member of the body of Christ. And you need to come this morning with an obedient heart and developing a faith in the Word. You don't have to know everything that's there. You need to know enough that you need to change the way you live life. You need to repent of the sin and the way that you've lived life. No longer living the way of the world and living in the, in the grips and the grasp of Satan but coming to the reality that God needs to be the focal point of your life. And you, when you do that, you come and you confess the name of Jesus as the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, we will immerse you in the watery grave of baptism so that you can contact the blood that was shed on the cross so your sins can be washed away. And if you come out of the watery grave, you can become a new creature. You can have a new outlook on life. You can learn what it's like to be patient to help make the church run well. Or perhaps this morning we have one who has wandered away. And this morning you need to come home. And you need to repent and confess of sin that exists in your life. The things that have pushed you you have pushed God out of your life. And you need to come this morning and you need God to come back in. Brethren, God will forgive you. Your brethren will forgive you. We want you to come. Make a need known so we can pray for you. Because we all want to get to heaven. We all want to reap the great reward that is ever before us. This morning, if you have a need, we're going to stand. We're going to sing a song to encourage you. You take that first step because only you can decide what your need is. And we pray that you will make your need known while we now stand and while we sing.